Very good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this session on monolith to modular uh, navigation approach. Really happy to talk about application modernization. Uh, one of the key trends that we see over the past several years is especially from companies which are specializing on platform technologies. Uh, we see a lot of transformation that's happening in the technology spectrum. For example, the programming languages, the tools and the frameworks, and the whole operating environment as well as the platform is rapidly changing. What that essentially means for the existing applications which are built over a period of time, uh, they find it really hard to cope with these technologies and the platforms. That's one of the problem statements we are uh, addressing through this presentation. Now, the question is, uh, legacy applications are fine, but given the fact that the new technologies are coming, why don't you rewrite the whole application for the new way, like the cloud native way? Uh, the short answer is no, because these applications are doing really good in those old times. They have the very good uh, business logic inbuilt into that. If you take a representative banking application, the whole business logic of the bank is embedded into the legacy application. It's not easy to change that. There is no need to change that. Um, and a lot of time and effort is spent on that. So how, how do you check out those business logic just because you have new way of computing? So uh, one of the trends that we see is modernize the application to fit the spectrum of the new technology. So how do you modernize? Uh, most of the leading organizations come up with best practices, tools, and methodologies. And that's uh, one of the main aspects we are going to cover in this presentation. So the way we uh, approach this is look at modernization as a strategy and then uh, pick up one item from that, which is application refactoring as a way to modernize things. There are one or two or three different aspects. We specialize on the uh, refactoring technique as a main theme. And then we introduce a modularity as a mean to refactor your application. And then look at modularity, uh, different types of modularity, which would fit different use cases which type of modularity fits in what type of use cases, etc. And then we introduce some of the tools that would help in modernizing your application. And then some of the best practices and the uh, methodologies that we can adopt. That's the whole flow of the application. Uh, she's Elsa Sakria and myself, Girish Punatil. We work for IBM in a team called IBM Runtimes, which uh, basically develops and supports language runtimes like Java and Eclipse. So some of the uh, insights that uh, we captured from the client feedback as well as field experience would be featuring in this presentation. So um, applications are vital for modern businesses. However, we know that many organizations are held back by the presence of legacy applications uh, that limit the growth and innovation that the product may have. So application modernization is a process of taking these legacy application and modernizing their uh, architecture or infrastructure or uh, adopting new language paradigms or semantics, etc. So when a product has been launched, it must have been great for the company, but later it may not be able to keep pace with the uh, latest advancements or technologies. So when um, in such a case, uh, we can always have the option to write a, a product from scratch, but uh, it takes a lot of time and also it is very expensive. So that is where application modernization comes into picture. So application modernization ensures that the initial investment that is made on the product is intact and it is ensured and it is extended as well as it makes, uh, it ensures that the product is always competitive in the market and always there is room for enhancement. Yeah. Now let's look at some of the needs and the opportunities that come by way of modernizing an application. The first one we already reiterated 
the workload is changing that means the business logic newer use cases are coming in and how do you your application cater to those business needs one of the simple example i can quote is um, ai is proliferating that means the traditional way of uh, functioning in your application could actually leverage ai to tap some of the newer way of functioning and uh, implement faster and better uh, value to the client that is using your business uh, application so that's directly driving the need for the application modernization the next one is uh, improved innovation like more focus on the business logic so application modernization uh, enhances the uh, innovation by allowing the developer to focus more on business logic like the core functionalities or coming up with features or enhancements that directly add value to the product so uh, by updating to modern technologies and practices the burden of dealing with the operational aspects of a product are reduced to a great and great extent in case of application modernization and the developer can solely focus on developing the code or developing new features and enhancements yeah and another thing is improved developer experience this means if you are modernizing your application what happens is there are huge amount of reusable software in the planet the so think about maven central think about npmjs.com these uh, repositories or registries host an array of modern uh, libraries which can be reused think about any business logic there is already a software that is sitting there which can be uh, easily reused or leveraged third party open source sort of libraries so legacy applications may not be easily able to make use of those things but once you modernize these things come very handy and developer can actually focus more on the business logic alone by you know uh, pick choosing the right library for their use next is uh, improved deploy ability or uh, modern platforms and frameworks so in application modernization sometimes we change the target platform we change from on premise applications to new modern cloud platforms so in this way we can focus on the way in which or the way in which the applications are deployed and managed and also uh, this will help in deploying managing and making the process much more faster yep and another thing is improved production efficiency if you look at the traditional applications the enterprise aspect of the application like the diagnostics the security the performance these are largely called as a diagno the enterprise capabilities these are always uh, custom created or custom developed for the particular application traditionally but if you look at the modern technology spectrum you see these things are coming as a reusable entity for example if you look at cloud cloud comes with um, inbuilt security into it cloud comes with inbuilt diagnostics into it think about the kubernetes think about the observability tools and things like that the application developer do not spend time on building these kinds of things into the application reuse it as much as possible from the modern technology spectrum so again that is another imperative for modernizing your application so next one is uh, improved maintenance support migration and upgradation so one great aspect of application modernization is that it always ensures that there is continuous support from the developer community and also the migration to newer versions of the product is much more easier uh, easier and also upgradations are more straightforward and this means that businesses can always rely on updated versions and there is always continued assistance and updates from the community yeah okay so here is a famous quote from gartner which says that the business should adopt a continuous modernization strategy as a more cost effective low risk approach that increases time to market and accelerate return on investment so the key is a continuous modernization strategy it's not just one time effort that's because the whole technology spectrum did not change one time it's continuously changing today it is uh, cloud native or ai or quantum computing etc there is no guarantee that these are going to be the technology for the future for indefinite amount of time it again undergoes changes changes the word the the one of the funny thing is the 
applications that we built over the period of time which we used to boast that this is the highly resilient highly optimal application is now being termed as monolith <laughs> when the microservice came that the, all the cool thing of the past has been termed as monolith so that that's the trend uh, indicative that the cloud native or whatever we call as modern thing today may be obsolete tomorrow so the the whole keyword here is a continuous modernization so that means modernization is part and parcel of the software development life cycle every business should keep that in mind and invest a good amount of their uh, time and effort in continuously modernizing their application that's the essence of this prediction so now let's see what are the different types of application modernization techniques that we have First one is re-architecture, that is using modern technology components. So uh, re-architecture in application modernization means upgrading the uh, technology components and redefining how they interact with each other. So it involves replacing the old legacy applications with new modern components. At the same time, we always make sure that the new replaced components work smoothly with the existing architecture. So this approach actually improves how the system runs and also it makes it more easier to handle the workload and also keeping up with the modern demands of the technology. Second one is uh, refactoring. So as the name suggests, refactoring means transforming the outdated coding styles into new coding styles or new programming practices and standards. So this technique uh, aims at improving the code readability, uh, reusability, maintainability and it always uh, improves the developer experience. So uh, one thing is that we are just changing the overall structure of the code but the external behavior is always the same. Next is retargeting. In case of retargeting it involves uh, shifting to modern uh, deployment targets or workload managers. Uh, this technique involves improving uh, where and how the applications are deployed. And this includes shifting from on-premise applications to new modern cloud platforms like using Docker for containerization, then Kubernetes or for orchestration. And also it enhances the scalability, maintainability and operational efficiency of the overall of the product. Next is rewrite. Rewriting is very simple. So this means uh, we are developing a new application from scratch by the use of modern technology. But this is really time consuming and also this uh, this is very uh, time consuming and also takes a lot of uh, effort. Yeah, rewriting is easy to say, but <laughs> that's the hardest of all in terms of uh, when it comes to practice. So now let's focus, zoom in on the application modernization through refactoring. What is refactoring? It involves restructuring and breaking down a monolith into collection of small, loosely coupled and self-contained microservices. We'll explain and qualify each of these keywords, what small means, what loosely coupled means, what self-contained means, etc. But at, at high level, uh, refactoring means make things into smaller pieces so that each one can be uh, processed or each one could be understood better in terms of the uh, software development lifecycle when it comes to scalability when it's come to development when it comes to you know applying the enterprise features like performance security and diagnostics each of these self-contained modules can be processed in a much better way than the big monolith yeah so so far we talked about uh, application modernization now let's see what are the disadvantages or problems involved in monolithic architecture First one is it is complex, that is difficult to comprehend. So monolithic applications are very large, complex code base. So it is very difficult to understand the entire application. So uh, this code base is very complicated and the different functionalities are tightly interwoven within. So this makes the code base really challenging for the developers to understand the entire system or identify issues or uh, make some fixes for that. So as a result, maintaining and updating it is also very difficult. Second one is coils or what we can say as difficult to enhance. So as I said earlier, this is a large code base and it is very difficult to understand. 
So uh, since the functionalities are tightly interwoven with, it is difficult to make any enhancement in one particular area. If you are making uh, an enhancement in one particular area, it is there is high chances that it may affect other areas of the product as well. Next is it is difficult to debug. So application uh, monolithic applications are very difficult to debug because they are large and complex. So it is very hard to narrow down to the particular location of the error or make some fixes for that. And uh, for this reason, the, it takes more time to debug the application and it becomes more challenging as well. Next is intertwined, uh, difficult to scale. So monolithic applications are difficult to scale because of their, uh, because the components are tightly linked to each other. So when different parts of the applications are tightly linked to each other, it, be it becomes more difficult to scale the product. Last one is uh, rigid, that is difficult to migrate. So uh, if we are having small modular units, it will become very easy to uh, migrate the units to uh, newer versions. But if the application is very large, then it is very hard to migrate the entire application to the newer versions. Yeah, it's funny and sad at the same moment. <laughs> the applications that we built over time is now qualified as coarse and complex and rigid, but from the newer platform and technology point of view, it's true. Maintainability and uh, various other aspects of the application becomes really hard when it comes to the existing monolithic application. <clears throat> now let's introduce modularity as one of the key powerful way of introducing the refactor. So what is, a, what is modularity? Modularity in simple way is a specification to modularize your application. One of the key thing that is involved is a module. Module is a collection of packages, resources, and metadata. Metadata, in simple words, is the module in Java, and resources could be anything like a file or a image, whatever, Java file, etc. And packages are the first class Java packages. Uh, modules are self-contained. That means several parts of the packages could be composed into one and there is no external dependency as such. If at all there is an external dependency that is well qualified through the metadata interface. Uh, cohesive meaning when you design your module, wh what is the considerations through which you will make your module? Make it as cohesive as possible. That is the related packages, related classes go into a package, related packages which have some sort of interconnections qualify into a module. Then loosely coupled, loosely coupled requires some amount of explanation. Between two modules, the coupling should be as minimal as possible. If a module has a dependency on another module, the dependency should be well explained through the module in Java. On the other hand, uh, make sure that the dependency is made through public APIs, dependency is made through interfaces, so that if the implementation of the uh, target library changes, that is not going to have any effect on the module which is depending on the target module. So that's the essence of loosely coupling. If, on the other hand, if you're calling a private function or a function which is not termed as API directly, then the changes made in the library will have adverse impact on the source library. So, in a sense, these uh, qualifiers make sure that the modules are addressing most of the drawbacks that we talked about in the previous slide of the monolith. The coerciveness is gone now, it is loosely coupled. The self-containment is attained by which the external dependency and the hardness of debugging, all those things are resolved. So, this is one of the key ways to refactor and modernize your application. Um, now let's see a demo session uh, where we create a sample Java application and a module. So here I have created uh, two module projects. One is modular Java project and the other one is modular Java project app. So here I have created a package as well, com.example.greetings and uh, in the second uh, 
package in the second uh, module i have created another package called com.example.app so this is the uh, this is the first uh, function first class where i have a class called greeting and i have a function called say hello and it returns a string value and in the second uh, second module i have the main class uh, and i'm calling the greeting class from this particular module so uh, So uh, this is a this is a module info dot Java of modular Java pro project app, and this is the this is a module dot info of greetings class. So if I want to access the function uh, say hello in the modular Java project, what I must include is I should export this particular project that is uh, com dot example dot greetings to modular java project app so if i uncomment this we will be exporting this particular project but at the same time in the module info java of modular java project app we must require the first project first uh, greeting modular greeting module name project so if i uncomment this we can see that uh, the error error will be uh, gone so now if i run the uh, main ja main dot java you can see that the function has been called okay so uh, that's about the demo about modularity uh, now Modularity itself comes in two variants. One is coming by way of JPMS, Java Platform Modular System, and then OSGI. So OSGI predates J JPMS. As we know, JPMS was introduced in Java 9, whereas OSGI is like 20 years old, I, I think so. OSGI itself comes in two variants. One is PDE and one is BND. We'll, I think we'll explain each of these things in the future slides. Yeah. Next, we have another demo uh, on how to create a plugin. So first, I'm going to create a plugin uh, of PD project. So going to new plugin project. So I'm giving a name as VD1. Then I'm creating a plugin under Eclipse. So I'm taking a sample uh, template like hello world command. So now if you uh, go to the bottom, you can see the manifest.mf of this particular plugin. So it has the manifest version, then uh, the name of the bundle, then what are the required bundles for this uh, particular bundle. and. Uh, what is the bundle version like 1.0.0 qualifier? Uh, so this is how you create a PD uh, plugin. Now let's see how we can create a plugin in BND. So new, then plugin project. Giving the name as BD2 and uh, taking the OSGI framework standard and generating the OSGI module automatically. So taking a sample one uh, like the run templates project. Now I'm opening the pd.bundle in the plugin manifest editor view. Close it and open. Yeah, so here we have the manifest.mf of pd.bnd. So one difference between pd and bnd is that 
In BNT, the manifest.mf file is automatically generated according to the code changes made by the developer. But in case of a PDE, it follows a code first approach. That means the developer writes the code and according to his code, he manually makes changes in the manifest.mf. So this is the bundle uh, manifest.mf of pd.bnd. So if you try to edit this one, it will ask for a pop-up. So this is this means that it is automatically generated. The PD BND manifest.mf is automatically generated. So if you try to edit, the framework will, will ask you if you really want to edit it. So that's how we create a PD.BND project. Yeah. Well, let's look at some of the uh, differentiation between JPMS and OSGI, which one is better or w w you know, what is the key difference between the two? So in terms of the scope, JPMS is uh, standard as part of the Java SC. So the, the modularity semantics is built into the virtual machine, whereas OSGI comes as an extension, uh, you know, outside of the JVM semantics. So. Um, Second one is granularity. It's much more uh, coarse grained, operate at the level of entire Java modules. Whereas uh, when it comes to OSGI modularity, it's much more fine grained and allows modularization at the package level. You can come down to any level that you want. In terms of dependency, it uses the module info.java, whereas OSGI uses the manifest file, which provides the dependency between various bundles. In OSGA terms, it is called bundles. In JPMS terms, it's called modules. Uh, in terms of dynamism, uh, JPMS do not provide a lot of dynamism as such. The two modules dependencies need to be uh, statically defined, whereas in case of OSGA, uh, it provides a good amount of dynamism. What is dynamism? So if you know the Eclipse plugins uh, analogy in Eclipse, you could actually uh, install a plugin, you can start a plugin, stop a plugin, and get a newer version of the plugin uh, loaded on the fly. So there is a complete life cycle in terms of how to manage the bundle of different versions inbuilt into the OSGI uh, framework or the logic. So uh, you can think about in terms of the hot code replacement, a, a newer version of the software could be loaded without actually uh, needing to recompile the whole of the dependency hierarchies. So that sort of dynamism is a key feature in OSGI. Um, but on the other hand, it, when it comes to adoption, widely adopted as part of the Java platform because uh, JPMS is part of the platform itself. When it comes to OSGI, it is much more uh, enterprise grade where there are a lot of dependencies that need to be resolved between different parties, between different team. That's where OSGA comes its relevance. We'll actually have uh, more talks on that in the future slides. <coughs> now let's discuss about the modularity types or different use cases that can be used. So uh, for applications that aim for efficiency, security, or minimal size, and the, those applications that need not worry about the frequent changes that is happening in the manifest.mf or bundle information can really go for JPMS, uh, JPMS type of modularity. And for those applications uh, whose components are developed by same team or co-located teams. So in that case, if the module is developed by the same team, then the changes made in the version can be really untested by the other developer. So in that case also, JPMS is uh, highly appreciated. And uh, for microservices which are developed, deployed, and managed independently, or those that communicate over server endpoints can also use JPMS because what is happening behind the server endpoints is not concerned by the developer. Next is uh, large applications that have complex dependency chain can use OSGI because OSGI comes with a semantic versioning system. So it is really helpful for large applications having very complex code base. And those applications that demand high level of adaptability, that is whether one bundle can be used uh, instead of other bundle, in those kinds of areas, we can really use OSGI. 
Yeah. Now, we talked about two variants of OSGI. One is PDE and BND. Where do you use the PDE style? Where do you use the BND style? There is no very uh, clear demarcation between those two. We did some research and uh, we found out that as both conform to the OSJ standards, the manifest.mf, which defines the metadata of the bundle, is one and the same. So there is, uh, under the cover, there is absolutely no difference. You could use PDE or BND. But when it comes to the development strategy, uh, if you are much more particular about the changes that's happening in the application and what changes need to be done in the module definition or the bundle descriptor, you go for PDE because you want finest level of control on how the module or the bundle is defined. This is called manifest first approach. Make changes in your application, like changing an API, making a breaking change, applying a patch fix, then accordingly change the version numbers in the manifest.mf based on your understanding about the change that you made, based on the bumping of the version in the code that happened, make the changes accordingly in the bundle version. When it comes to BND, BND makes the manifest descriptor transparent to the application. So you don't worry about what is the manifest version and things like that. You keep developing your code, make changes, and BND framework under the cover uh, performs bytecode analysis and um, studies the changes that you are making and figures out what corresponding changes need to be done in the manifest uh, bundle. So that is much more seamless. So the, the question is, do you want finest level of control on your bundle descriptor versus do you want the finest level of abstraction and dynamism? So based on that, you can pick choose between these two. Otherwise, from the semantics point of view, the finest final product point of view, there is absolutely no difference. If you create a bundle using PND, can it make use of a bundle that is created by PDE and vice versa? Yes, absolutely yes, because the underlying semantics is the same. Now let's see what is the connection between team composition and modularity. So as I said earlier, if the same team is developing all the components, then JPMS is enough because changes made in one module is easily identified and captured in other modules without worrying about the version, versioning system. But in case of OSGI, uh, we use OSGI when different modules are created by different developers. So in that case, we always need a system to track the version changes that is happening within the manifest.mf. So in that case, we use OSGI bundles. Yeah. So he here is a summarization of the PDE versus BND uh, comparison. Uh, PDE doesn't perform bytecode analysis. It expects the developer to make the changes in the manifest manually, whereas BND, it is automatic using bytecode analysis. Um, BND supports automated jar creation based on the changes in the application code. Uh, automatic semantic versioning we already talked about. Um, I, I believe everybody knows about the semantic versioning. Um, it's an x dot y dot set notation. If you're making minor changes like bug fixes, etc., which do not impact the external interfaces like the public function signature and things like that, it goes into the patch version change. If you introduce a new API, which uh, do not have any implications on the existing code, that um, makes uh, bumping on the minor version. Whereas if you make a breaking change, which will cause existing code that depended on your application, sorry, your bundle will need to be rewritten based on your changes, that's a major version change. So that, that's the essence of semantic version. So the whole semantic version change is managed by BND automatically, while you need to manually supply those adhering to the version semantics in case of PDE. <coughs> On the other hand, both supports the templated based uh, creation of bundles. Both are fully OSGI compliant. So th that's just a summarization of the difference between PDE and BND. Now let's see um, 
execution environment versus modularity so uh, you can say a yes or no for each of the question so let's see if deployment target has any connection with modularity type so when we choose a modularity when we use a deployment target should we should we consider which type of modularity to be adopted does anyone know any answer whether deployment target has any connection with modularity type so the answer is no actually deployment target is act uh, modularity is actually a function of the complexity of the code it doesn't have any connection with the deployment target next is application architecture versus modularity type this uh, application architecture we have different types of architectures like layered architect layered architecture or reactive architecture so does application architecture have any connection with modularity type anyone the answer is no uh, modularity type doesn't have any connection with the application architecture next is workload type versus modularity type here also modularity type doesn't have any connection with the workload that the uh, module has next is java version versus modularity type this uh, in a way has a connection because uh, we know that jpms was uh, introduced introduced in java 9 so all the versions from java 9 will have the modularity but uh, till java 8 it doesn't have modularity so if you want to have a jpms type of modularity you need to use versions starting from java 8 and the last one is operating system versus modularity type uh, whether it is mac os linux or windows modularity doesn't has anything to do with the operating system yeah so the summary of that slide is basically what parameters or what constraints the modularity type depends on and it actually look at the structure of your application and how it can be decomposed. That's the whole idea. It's not about the platform. It's not about the deployment target. Are you hosting on cloud or versus desktop? Modularity doesn't worry about that at all. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the modularity based best practices. So first one is do a top-down approach. Look at the whole application in general and see how the top-level composition of it is and see if the if you can un identify components and their interreactions from looking from the top and then design your modules in that perspective. Um, one of the main mistake people do is confusing between packages and modules. So the, the key thing is classes that are related go into a package and packages which are much more cohesive related go into the module so module comes at a higher level of abstraction than the packages not vice versa uh, expose only necessary interfaces this is key because if you expose everything as public apis for um, external world they make much more dependencies with your bundle so expose only the minimal things so that way the loose coupling becomes very very prominent and define consistent versioning we talked about the semantics versioning if you don't follow the version semantics properly then you're breaking the ecosystem if you make changes to a public api in the way it is being called and if you don't up the major version the consuming entities wouldn't expect any changes that need to be done but they will get compiler error, runtime error sort of thing. So it's a best practice to always follow the semantics versioning. Um, knowing your consumers and producers help you to make the best abstraction of your software is a general best practice. And uh, don't mix the modularity types. Between PD and BND, I would say it's fine as long as that uh, conforms to the OSGA standards, whereas JPMS versus OSGI don't mix it because they don't understand each other in simple words yeah so so far we talked about different types of uh, ways in which we can uh, modernize application now let's see some of the tools that we can use to modernize application first one is mono to micro so ibm mono to micro is actually an ai driven uh, tool that is uh, designed to refactor the large java applications into microservices so here, um, it simplifies the management and deployment of the microservices in WAS, that is uh, 
WebSphere application server liberty and open liberty. So it basically performs a static and dynamic analysis of the code that you have in your application. And based on the, and it's, it is actually run using machine learning code. And uh, from the suggestions, it anal analyzes your application's code and it suggests some kind of partitions, like whether it's some kind of packages or classes that should go as a module or microservice. So these suggestions uh, are presented in an easy to use interface and you can review and adjust those uh, suggestions according to your business needs. And after refining the recommendation, the uh, Mono to Micro itself will provide certain code uh, which will modularize or, or modernize your application. And this is actually an iterative process, though. So this continues until you your specific microservice is generated. Next is uh, Transformation Advisor. This is also uh, similar to uh, Mono to Micro, but the difference is that this will give you a suggestion, but Mono to Micro will transfer your uh, application into a modularized application. So in Transformation Advisor, it will provide you some of the basic useful insights into uh, the complexity of your code or the issues or some kind of uh, complexity that you may face while modularizing or modernizing your application. So uh, there are three types of categories like simple, uh, moderate and complex. So it will analyze your code or analyze your application and will tell you if the uh, process of changing into a modern application is whether complex or simple or uh, moderate. Next is uh, WCA for Java, stands for Watson uh, Code Assistant for Java. This is also uh, uh, this also has the same functionality like the about to, but it analyzes the existing code and it will provide useful insights into what changes that you need to make in your Java program uh, or what changes that you need to make in the code. So it is actually, it actually plays a crucial role in the modernization of Java application. Uh, it analyzes the existing configuration. Uh, it provides a migration recommendation, then automated configuration files. And also it will help you to integrate new DevOps practices into your existing application. The other ones are Azure Migrate from Microsoft, uh, Google, CCAMP and VMware Tansu and Open Text App Mode. These are also different types of application modernization techniques that you can uh, uh, use to modularize or turn your application turn your applications into a modern application. Yeah, we don't we didn't do a lot of research on the other tools, but it's a clear manifestation or it's a clear proof point that all the leading companies who are into the platform technologies, they are having tools to migrate or modernize your application. That clearly uh, tallies back into what Gartner has predicted. All the uh, legacy applications, all the existing applications need to continuously look for modernizing. And there is a clear trend that is, uh, trend that is seen because the, the application execution environment is undergoing a rapid, rapid transformation. Now, uh, some of the methodologies, how do you do the modernization? Uh, break down monolith into components, uh, separate legacy components and expose as endpoints. So legacy components, in some cases, they are quite valuable. One example I can quote is a COBOL application. It's robust, running for the last 50 years. You don't need, you can't rewrite that because some of the, the lo you don't have a COBOL developer anymore. So. Uh, it's not easy. So <clears throat> key thing is keep it like a service and uh, look at com compartmentalizing the rest of the application. Keep this um, legacy component in the middle. Everything else get uh, inherited into the monolithic nature. So separate them out and look at modernizing the rest of the components. Uh, convert hot components into microservices because those are the ones which uh, undergoes scalability, performance, and diagnostic aspects. So keep those things into microservices. Don't convert everything into microservices. People, I mean, by this time, we know the <laughs> the downside of microservices. It adds more complexity. Tiny piece of function, tiny classes, convert into microservices. You are making more uh, trouble than before. So take out only the hot components. 
build security into data centric uh, services is because previously a function A was calling function B in a monolith. Now A and B came into two separate microservices. They are talking across uh, endpoints, across internet. So there is a security that is required to be inbuilt into that. So those are <laughs> newer side effects. Build DevOps into dynamic components, components that undergoes rapid SDLC lifecycle, undergoes development changes rapidly, need to have the CI, CD pipelines and things like that. Uh, and again, previously a monolith need uh, used to have a single logging system and going through the logs, which already have a timestamp, follow the chronology, you know what the application has been doing. But now these are in the microservices with different timestamps. You need an aggregator, you need a visualizer, you need an observability tool to get some sense out of the microservices. Uh, so in essence, these are some of the best practices or methodologies that we have seen and when do you adopt the uh, modernization strategy. Now let's see what, what are the best practices that you can follow in application modernization. First one is to root, uh, choose the right architecture. It is very important to pick choose the right architecture if you are uh, going for modernizing. Next one is to choose the right level of abstraction. So if you have a lot of classes, then decide which one should go as a package and which one should go as a module. So uh, which all classes can be reused and which all classes need to really go as a microservice. Next one is choose the right data sources. Always be sure that you choose modern data sources for uh, application modernization. Next is have sponsor uses. Always think that you are, you are developing an application for some customer. So don't Try to build a design for your own need. You should always consider a sponsor. Try to include that sponsor in your application modernization strategies uh, to, to understand the needs of the customer. Next is to keep up with the keep up with the latest technologies. Sorry, automate as much as possible. It is very important that you should automate as much as possible. Then keep up with the latest technologies and releases uh, and software updates. So try to use the latest software available in the market. And uh, next is to keep future enhancements in mind. So it is very important that the technologies are always improving. So we should always make room for future enhancements. You should always write your code in such a way that you can always uh, bring about new enhancements and changes in your application and always perform a data flow analysis. So by performing data flow, you will really understand the flow of uh, your application. What are what are the ways in which you can modernize? Yeah. So that was it. In summary, we looked at application modernization as a modern strategy adopted by most of the leading companies with best practices, methods, and uh, tools introduced into that. Then we categorized modernization into three uh, refactoring, retargeting, and re-architecting. Uh, and we specialized on the refactoring. And we introduced modularity, and we looked at different types of modularity. We looked at what are these types and where this would be applied in different use cases. Then we came back to the modernization, looked at the tools and methodology and best practices. Most of the uh, concepts and uh, best practices that we talked about are taken from these links these are publicly available. Some of the tools which are available for free trial, like 60 days, 90 days. In some cases, some customers we have seen, they are able to figure out the modernization strategy just by using the free trial because it, it's a one-time activity. So uh, you could use that in abundance and see how your existing application is structured and what sort of modernization strategy can be adopted through that and uh, the JPMs and the OSGI things are completely open. So it's community driven. So you can go ahead and understand the latest trends and the latest specification on those things to improve your application. The whole idea is to make your application a subject for the continuous modernization and thereby stay latest and greatest, make use of all the you know modern use cases, modern libraries and things like that. So that was the message we wanted to pass. Thank you so much. Right on time. Any questions? 
it's a good presentation thank you uh, but one aspect like kind of uh, the presentation like what made you that like you did not cover about the data migration part which is part of the total ap application modernization which is another crucial factor okay uh, because usually like though how competitively the modernization has been done but the migration of data is also an integral part of this yep. complete revamp of the system yeah uh, so which could which is an another major risk factor yep. which is usually overlooked uh, so how is it being countered or mitigated these risks sir so uh, absolutely right data migration is a key component is a key consideration when it comes to any enterprise application that has a huge back end data so i'm looking we are looking from a platform point of view most of the tools and methodologies that you looked at are platform level so uh, the code refactoring is the one which we specialized react architecting the data transformation is absolutely a key aspect um, probably the uh, rdbms to the nosql sort of things are being researched it's just that we didn't come across such things in our field experience but really appreciate that that's a real good point yeah because in in banking that's one crucial aspect yeah when i worked on some migration projects in 10 years ago yeah. like there was a major hit in terms of the financial statements yeah because of a poor migration and data mapping yeah. that's the reason and are so there the any tools to counter that which is in align with app modernization uh, agenda yeah. uh, that's completely different uh, which usually ibm uh, keeps it gives it to the hand it over to the different department true i agree yeah okay. the ai use case is good all these things are good but your database is using rdbms whereas mm -hmm. most of the pipelines need a unstructured data to start with so absolutely right okay thank you so much everybody once again